right, welcome back. This is still the chapter on possession, which is chapter two, um, but we're in the second portion of this chapter, which we very briefly began last week, um, which is possession as it relates to land. So we're done with stuff, right, objects, which is what we covered so far. Um, and we looked at possession as a means of acquiring title in personal property, stuff, right? So you, we said if you find something and you acquire possession over it, and we said that means physical possession and the requisite intent, we said it has to be generally, right, absent specific circumstances, um, such as a baseball match, it has to be physical possession, right, dominion over the thing and the requisite intent. And we said that that gives you what we call a possessory interest, which is an interest to get possession back again if someone takes it away from you. And that possessory interest, we said, is good against all but the true owner. So the true owner has prior title by virtue of their ownership. We said the chain matters, right? The time matters. And therefore, because they are prior in time, they have a superior interest and you cannot exercise your possessory interest against the true owner. Over time, we said, with a thing we call a statute of limitation, you can acquire complete ownership by virtue of your possessory interest. Your possessory interest over time, right, morphs into full actual ownership, therefore to the exclusion of the prior owner, because the statute of limitation provides that after a certain period of time, the interest of the owner is itself extinguished and therefore vests upon you. It doesn't actually vest upon you, but you become the first in time and therefore you can claim against all, which is essentially ownership. Second part of the chapter, we look at possession as it relates to land. Land is different. It's the second type of property we have, real property, as opposed to stuff, which we said is personal property. Land is different because we said there's no such thing as lost land, right? You can look at the registry, which is mandated by law. So people have got to tell you who owns their land and that is mandated by law and therefore there's no lost land. You know whose it is. So we're going to have different concepts here because you don't find the land, right? You always know who the owner is and so your possession if it's going to acquire eventual ownership over the land, it's going to mean that you're going to exercise a, a, an interest, right? Um, uh, you're going to exercise possession in a way that is hostile or that excludes the rightful owner. And to the extent that they don't um, complain in time, by virtue, again, of the statute of limitations, which generally is going to be 10 years with respect to land, then you can acquire ownership, again, kind of similar to personal property, by virtue of your possession alone. We've got the same justifications as we did before, right, um, as to why it is that we allow people to acquire ownership by virtue of possession. Certainly, a long time ago, right, when these rules were made up in England 200 years ago, there wasn't a land registry, right, or 400, 600 years ago. There wasn't a land registry, and therefore, possession was pretty helpful as an indication of ownership, right? You knew who owned the land because they were on it, right, not because it was written in a land registry. More importantly, we said there are certain issues as to first notice, even when there is a land registry, Having possession is helpful because it gives everyone notice that you have possession, right? Um, that you have potential ownership. When you're on it, right, you are showing the world that you are in possession. And that's helpful for people if they want to know, right, whose it is or if they want to buy it from you, for instance. Second justification is what we call kind of a labor theory which is we want things to be used efficiently. And if for 10 years the owner of the land doesn't figure out that someone's on it, right? So for 10 years they don't show up and look at who's on it and try to repossess it, that's not efficient use of land. 
right? Clearly, they're not, right, um, making proper upkeep of it. Clearly, they're not building a building on it, anything useful, and therefore, we want to penalize them and reward indirectly, but more penalize, right, the person who has been on it and has been making productive use of it, right? And that's generally something that we think is valuable as a society, right? For stuff, including land, to be used productively. So we said that the statute of limitations on land is 10 years generally in Ontario and in most provinces. And so, right, the, the, the rights of the owner are extinguished after 10 years. And that's much longer than the statute of limitations on most things, which is usually two years. So on an action, a right, something that you're trying to exercise, generally the limitation period is much shorter. And generally for reasons having to do with the fact that people have to be able to defend themselves. So if you get sued for personal injury, you might very well be sued wrongfully, but you might not be able to prove it because um, by the time you get sued, you don't have your paperwork anymore. So you don't keep it for 10 years. And therefore we have a shorter limitation period. So generally the, the, the way in which um, a possessor is going to exercise their right is, um, is what we call quieting title. So when they claim by virtue of the statute of limitations, so when you have a subsequent possessor show up and say, now I want ownership because the statute of limitation is passed. So at that point, the registry, because as we said, it's mandatory, is gonna say who the owner is. And so when the person shows up, right, they want their name to be cleared from the registry and want it to be replaced with their own. And that's what we call quieting title, quieting the prior title of the actual owner, which is still going to be in the land registry. And you're, ac you're asking the people who run the land registry to essentially remove their name and replace it with yours. So, um, there, there are, of course, issues as to how we are going to define possession and um, what is going to be sufficient to constitute possession of land, right? It's not obvious whether you walk on it, how often you have to be on it, whether you take care of it, if that's sufficient, right? Um, if you put a fence around it, certainly that, um, that's a way for you to assert the fact that you uh, want to control it, right? So we'll have to assess what constitutes possession, but generally there are going to be um, three things that we will um, that we'll consider. We'll call them the action and the intent and the exclusion. So you'll have to have first physical possession. That's the action. So whatever it is, we just said there's a spectrum of things, it's often going to depend, right? That's the action. Then you have to have the intent to exclude the rightful owner. Doesn't mean you have to do something illegal, but you have to have an intent to act as the owner, basically. That's a better way to put it. And you have to, in fact, actually exclude the owner. And so if they show up any time it stops, so it's a 10 year thing, right? So if at one point during the 10 years, they show up and they say, right? It's no longer what we call peaceful possession. They show up and they say, hey, I want you out of my property. And then they'll call the police or whatever, right? Um, then you're no longer in fact excluding the owner and therefore the limitation period is over. It starts again. So it has to run for the full 10 years and anything that interrupts the prescription, right, means that the clock starts over from that moment. So first case you have, and all this um, is presented a bit confusingly because um, you kind of have the evolution of the standard there, and so you're taught stuff that turns out to be incorrect or principles that have evolved over time and we'll see what the actual rule of law is 
um, at the end of the term. So first case you've got um, um, at the end of the class, sorry, the, ter the end of the term would be far too sad. Um, so by the end of the class, we'll know what the rule of law is, but we'll still see the evolution of it over time. So you have first the Russ Sinclair case um, where you have someone use um, someone else's land, basically, um, and apparently without their consent. And then you have, page 144, a bunch of facts as to what they do, right? Um, and then it's a matter of which of these factual, um, factual actions is going to count as um, the requisite act of possession. At none of the time you're told that they have the permission of the owner. That's the intent. So they're exercising possession to the exclusion of the owner because they do not have their permission. And the conclusion is that um, it was not sufficient possession, essentially be for, for the last reason, right? Because it was not, um, it, it was not um, used um, in a way that is to the exclusion of, um, of the rightful owner. So, for instance, you tried to buy it from them, right? At some points, the, 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 the actual owners uh, made certain uses of the, of the land and therefore it wasn't to their full exclusion, it was not sufficient. The important principle that um, comes out of the case is that essentially the action of the owner that is required for them to essentially interrupt the prescription, for them to stop the clock, to stop the possession of the third party, is going to be less than what you will expect of the third party. So the third party has got to do something obvious. They have to have actual possession. It has to be clear because as we said, one of the reasons why we, um, we require that is because we want people to have notice. We want people to know that you intend for that to be yours. And so it's going to have to be sufficient. There's going to have to be clear possession with the requisite intent that actually excludes the owner. However, the owner doesn't have to meet that because they have ownership. So there's no notice requirement there, right? So if the neighbor wants to know who owns the land, they don't have to have these things, right? They can just look at the land registry and they'll know who the owner is. And the owner can make whatever use of it they want and that can be occasional use, right? As long as the occasion is within a 10 year period. So if they show up within the 10 years, they can make occasional use and that's sufficient. It's not incompatible with ownership, right? And therefore it will count as interrupting the third party's exclusion of them from their land. So that is fully sufficient and it will interrupt the clock. As long as it's an act of ownership, right? That's sufficient to um, negate this, negate this intent to exclude the owner and this actual exclusion of the owner. Of course, it's a matter of degree, right? If the person, if the actual owner acts as someone who's invited on there once in a while, right? And then they leave when they're told to leave, then that will not interrupt the prescription period, for example. But as long as they make an action that's of ownership, right? Um, that's more like, hey, this is mine, right? I'm here because it's mine, I'll ask for permission, and I might even tell you to leave. Right, that will be sufficient, and so you don't have the same threshold. The third party that's trying to get, to get eventual title by virtue of possession has to have something that's far more obvious, clear, and continuous than the actual owner. And it's a, a, a relatively simple action by the owner is gonna to suffice to interrupt the prescription period. And there's also a mention that um, if you enclose, a, if you put a fence on it, right, that's a particularly um, helpful indication that you intend to have possession. There are issues as to um, co-owners. Um, you can exclude a co-owner because they're an owner. So if the other co-owners, 
right, start excluding that person from their land and, and, and meet the requisite criteria, that's sufficient and they can acquire the balance of ownership that's vested upon that, that, that person. Um, another um, thing that's mentioned um, at the beginning of the chapter that's somewhat important is if you have, um, wow, well, it's poorly written on my part, um, if you have what we call a tenancy at will. So if you've got a lease without a lease, right? So say you sign a one-year lease um, and then it's, not, it's neither renewed, right? Nor, nor do you vacate the property. You're in a tenancy at will by law, which means that you pay by month and um, the, the owner can't evict you if you, keep, if you keep paying as long as they didn't you know, lease to some, someone else in the meantime, um, but it becomes a tenancy at will. And that's a particular type of tenancy that can be terminated by the owner, right, with a certain notice period, right, but that obligates you to pay your rent even though you don't have necessarily a contractual arrangement. If you've got that, right, the 10-year period starts running after one year. So you can be on, in a tenancy at will and you can claim as against the owner possession to, act, to acquire eventual ownership after one year. So it's 11 years total from the beginning of that tenancy. Um, we will look at um, interests in land um, for I think the next um, three weeks. Um, so you'll get very sick of this and it's the tough stuff that um, you probably won't find that, um, that interesting, but we'll still try to remember the terminology um, in a preliminary way, which is an estate is a right in land. So a lease, so for instance, a tenancy at will is what we call a leasehold estate. So it's an interest in land, right? Um, and what the owner has, that's a property right, by the way. So it's the, in the bundle, right? Not the whole thing. It's a leasehold estate. It's a property interest, right? Um, the owner retains, as we said, right? So the owner ha also has a property interest. We said that earlier in the term, namely that when your lease is done, they get not only the right to show up, which is a property interest, which we call the right of reversion. Reversion because it reverts back to the owner, right? Not only do they have a right of reversion, they have a right of possession at that point. Right of reversion means to get possession back in addition to their other rights, namely they get money in exchange for what they gave you. And there's a brief mention of um, successive um, leases. And, and, and if you have um, successive leases, it does not count. Um, so if you have two 10-year leases or one-year leases and the owner does not actually exercise the right of reversion, does not physically show up to get possession back as they are legally entitled to and instead renews the lease or uh, leases it to someone else, that does not right, um, constitute a sufficient um, showing of possession for the purposes of interrupting this. And we'll take a virtual break on that.